Dr. Sternberg, is it a great joy to have you, a great joy to be with you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be able to talk to you today. Wonderful. Dr. Robert Sternberg is one of the most cited psychologists of the 20th century. He's authored and co-authored over 1,500 publications, including articles, books, chapters in books. And it's a great joy to be with you and to have the time to present to our viewers and listeners some of the marvelous work you've done. Let's take maybe two areas of great concern in human life. Intelligence, because we want to succeed and feelings, because this is ultimately what we live our life through, which means um, feeling of happiness, feeling of love, the needs that we have. And you have so beautifully delved into these areas, which are quite complex uh, in, in terms of defining them, their categories, and what they do for us. So shall we start with intelligence? Because this is the intellect guiding our life in terms of uh, decision making. And people have a different perception uh, of what to be intelligent is. And you have so beautifully highlighted that there are all kinds of intelligence, that it's not just the person who succeeds in academics, the person who is great in mathematics or physics or astronomy or whatever, but also the people who can live life better and make their life better and have intuitive decisions rather than just uh, analytical decisions so there are components of intelligence and there are uh, areas in which these components are uh, playing their role or are being uh, analyzed, synthesized and categorized, etc. So can we talk about the three components? And by the way, it's amazing that a lot of your work puts things in three factors of three, be it in love, be it in in different things. It might be interesting why the three number keeps coming, but that's a different story. So let's see what are the, the components of intelligence. I have to you... tell you first, though, that the biggest surprise was when we had triplets. That <laughs> I'm serious. I that see. was too much. Uh, oh, wonderful. Tell chance, me about it. You had triplets? triplets. Uh, we have triplets, yeah. So when you say I do things in three, uh, I take the three very serious. <laughs> <laughs> and are they different to any extent, the triplets, the one from uh, the other? Two are identical twins, and they're girls, and the third is a boy, and they're all 11 years old, as you would uh, figure. They're all the same age. Yeah, but I, you were talking about three, so I thought <laughs> I should mention just how seriously I take it. So in terms of intelligence, uh, the usual view is of intelligence in a very academic sense, as IQ or a score on a standardized test, an ACT, an SAT, or whatever you And what I have emphasized is that IQ tests were originally designed for a very specific purpose, and that is to predict academic achievements. Uh, they were designed by Binet in 1905 to figure out which kids needed special education in Paris. And that's all they were designed for. It was really a very specialized purpose. Somehow, something de devised over 100 years ago that was made for a specific purpose is taken on a life of its own. And it's being used way beyond what it was originally intended to do. So, I view intelligence in a very different way, and that is figuring out what you want to do with your life, devising a plan to do it, and then as the plan goes along, making sure it's working or if it's not working, correcting it, and sometimes changing your goals and sometimes changing your path to the goals. But it's about what you do with your life. It's not about whether you remember how to compute a sine or a cosine. So, in order effectively to sort of plot out your life, 
Uh, these days, I'm saying you need four abilities rather than three. You need the analytical ability that IQ test measures, sure. But there are other things that are more important. The first is creative skills and a creative attitude, because intelligence isn't just skill. It's also an attitude toward life. And by creativity, I mean, in one sense, that you're willing and able to come up with ideas that are novel and different and that are useful. But the main thing, it, it means you think for yourself, that you're willing not just to do what everyone else does, but to do things your own way. And that's hard to do because there's so much pressure to conform and do things the way everyone else does it. But that's the first thing that you think for yourself and you've got, you might say, the courage to defy the crowd, to do things the way you think and sometimes know is the right way to do them. The second element is the analytical one, which the IQ tests somewhat measure, but they measure it in a very narrow and academic sense. So if you think about standardized tests, whether it's ACT, SAT, A-level, GREs, LSE, you know, whatever the test is, think about how different they are from real world problems. It's incredible. Real world problems aren't multiple choice. They often don't have a single answer. They change as you try to solve them. The problem keeps changing. There's no one path to solution. They're emotionally involving. They have real world consequences. I could go on. But my point is that if you think of any significant real world problem, dealing with your kids, dealing with your partner, dealing with paying bills, anything in the real world, it has almost nothing to do with these very highly structured, multiple choice, right or wrong kinds of problems on IQ tests. So even the analytical part of the theory is not just about academic skills that beyond school don't matter much. The third part is common sense or practical intelligence. And what we have found in our research, and you don't even need the research, everyone knows this, yeah. is that common sense and IQ are really different things. There are a lot of people, and some of them are politicians in our country, <laughs> who, who have very high IQs and have gone to Harvard and Yale and Princeton and prestigious schools, and they have no common sense. And they get elected to the Senate and the House of Representatives, and some of them become governors. And all you have to do is listen to them open their mouths. And you realize, and it's not just politicians, you realize there's so many people in so many walks of life who, whatever their IQ is, they have no common sense. And sometimes people with high IQs make the mistake of thinking that a high IQ guarantees common sense when it doesn't. And the last, the fourth element that I've added more recently is wisdom. And wisdom is basically seeking a common good. Because what I realized is missing in the world. We have so many challenges in the world today. Uh, you know, pollution and global warming and wars and violence and, you know, diseases. It's not enough for us any longer just to think about intelligence as what can I do for me? Wisdom is about trying to find a common good. It's how can I use my brains and my all my skills to advance not just myself, but to make things better for others too. And so if you look at intelligence broadly, you begin to realize that we're just measuring the wrong things. And the result is we end up with people in positions of power, whether it's government or businesses or universities for that matter, who maybe aren't the right ones. That's beautiful. So 
we have, uh, you have taken examples of Alice and Barbara and <laughs> that have been one is uh, high IQ in this sense and Barbara is, uh, is somebody who's intuitive and uh, they were both taken in, in at Yale University, I guess. And uh, they both contributed deeply to the research, to advancement of knowledge and advancement of science. And so the one who is intuitive and not uh, high IQ necessarily, but has more of a, can we say right brain versus left brain? Of course, these are not so dramatically divided. We know this, this theory of specificity in right and left has been a bit debunked, but there are at least functions of gestalt, functions of wholeness, at the same time, functions of categorizing and specificity and putting things in individual um, corners. Did you look at like brain anatomy and physiology at all to see if this correlates with actual anatomical function or uh, we, we don't need to go there? The I don't do uh, neuropsychological research. But the preponderance of evidence today is that intelligence is very broadly distributed over the brain, that it's not like here or right. there, that it's broadly distributed and that a lot of the intelligence is in the connections. Uh, you know, people have different views of this. For me, you know, understanding intelligence is not about what what does the brain do when you need to decide whether to get it in a relationship or what does the brain do when you decide that it's probably a really bad idea for a country to attack another country uh with dreams of a glorious empire i don't think you need the brain part to study those kinds of things or even how you turn on your car with your key uh which is not to i think your research is important but the point you were making is that I came up with that theory, not by some kind of, uh, you know, biological study, but from real world examples. Uh, and the examples you were talking about were uh, when I was at Yale, which I, where I was for most of my career. Uh, Alice was somebody who really did, was very high IQ and did well on tests and got good grades. But so she was IQ smart, but not very creative. In Barbara, the example I gave, these are real people, but not their real names. Barbara was someone who was very creative, but didn't test well. And many creative people don't test well, because if you're creative on the test, you're screwed. I mean, you just can't do that. <laughs> um, so my concern with people like Barbara is they have so much to offer, but they often don't get a chance because many societies use tests so heavily. And then there was a third student, Celia, who wasn't as analytically smart as Alice or as creative as Barbara, uh, but when she applied for jobs, got every job she applied for. And at the time, I asked, how did she do that? I, mean, I never did that. And uh, I realized that she was someone who could go into a job interview, figure out what they wanted to hear, and give it to them. <laughs> you know, she just knew what they wanted to hear. So she was what I came to call practically smart. And it's find, the contextual kind of, contextual yeah, kind of. Contextual intelligence that, you know, it's one thing to be analytic another be creative but in the end you have to do something with it yeah I, you know i sometimes say that intelligence is about adapting to the environment that's a sort of standard definition and this is someone celia who can make their intelligence work in the real world but i would also emphasize the kinds of abilities uh that uh, dora had which is do something to make the world a better place. The world is so challenged now with really serious problems. I mean, we have one uh, 
dictator who's threatening to use nuclear weapons and we have COVID that doesn't seem to want to go away and we have global warming that's uh, leading to hurricanes, uh, including in Florida, your own state, that are almost unbelievable. And if we don't use our intelligence to make the world better, we won't be around as a species. And, you know, if we leave the world to the viruses, bacteria, and cockroaches, what will it mean for us to have said we were such a smart species? I mean, that doesn't sound very smart. (laughs) So we need to start thinking about the future and how to use our intelligence in a more effective way to ensure that our kids and our grandkids and their kids have a world to live in. So... Uh, the contextual part, maybe people are familiar with the term uh, street smart, you know, mm-hmm. the, the yeah. street smart person who maybe doesn't make it well at school, is not, a, it's not an artist or a painter or a creator, but they manage and they really manage well because they know how to look at the environment and select things and be prepared for it. And I think you, of course, analyze this in quite detail uh, in terms of the components of street smartness. Yeah, (laughs) and and street smarts also applied to improving the world, to making a positive, meaningful, and possibly enduring difference to the world. Because there are people who are street smarts who are only looking out for themselves. And we need to go beyond that to people who will look out for others as well. That's beautiful. So what would then be the end uh, goal or end product of intelligence if we want to look at it? Because some people say or could assume that what is the reference that says ultimately uh, you've lived your life in an intelligent way? Is it happiness? Is it fulfillment of your desires? Is it making a contribution to society that improves society? You know, you're adding this wisdom side, you know, discovering something. Uh, So these are different kinds of applications of intelligence. But is there like a common goal or different goals uh, that can say, well, in your track, you've succeeded. uh, And that is, I'm happy that we have this kind of intelligence in our society. Yeah, well, I think it's important that everyone set their own goals and that we not specify in advance what people's goals should be. What I would say is that while achieving happiness and fulfillment, for me, and this is just for me, uh, the meaning of life is to make the world a better place, even if it's in a small way. It could be in your family. It could be in your community. It could be uh, nationally or in a company. It you know, small way, big way, but that the world is a little bit better for us having lived in it. But that's that's the way I see the meaning of life, and others might see it differently. But if everyone's selfish, if everyone just looks out for themselves, uh, we we as humanity don't have much of a future. Oh, beautiful. As you know, we um, my my area and field of. Uh, interest after having gone through the academics and the rigmaroles of medicine and neurology and all of that and neuroscience has been developing consciousness and the title of our podcast is consciousness is all there is not this particular podcast but the general theme Mm -hmm. under which we work and that is uh, consciousness how does consciousness play a role of course We are conscious human beings, and the more we have a broad understanding and broad consciousness, the the more uh, information we are able to to have, the more uh, the container of knowledge is bigger, so the bigger the container of knowledge, and also uh, intelligence. Some people kind of sometimes um, mix the idea of broader consciousness with greater intelligence, which is not necessarily the case, but broader consciousness might be an important factor in whatever type of of intelligence one is 
dealing with, which means not being focused on small aspects, but try to see more variables, more factors. And that's really what you are doing in the sense of showing that intelligence has different applications in different places, different um, results come from different types of intelligence. And therefore, as you also said, the brain, for example, uh, is not just a localized area that intelligence here or there, yet we know that the brain has many, many functions that are different. It's not like one, one thing that does things. So there is, at the same time, broadness, at the same time, localization. So we know that if you damage this one part of the brain, you're going to lose that one faculty. If you damage that other part, you lose that other faculty. And so this is what got me personally interested in full development through mental procedures such as transcendental meditation that has been shown to lead to greater coherence in brain functioning and opening up the reserves and having more the total brain function rather than specific parts uh, that are stimulated by specific conditions. So have you looked at consciousness as such uh, from, from your work? Like, of course, we know that we can be alert, we can be drowsy, we can be hyper alert. Uh, and then how does this influence, therefore, also response, uh, quickness of response, reaction rate, uh, the ability to manage these different tasks uh, that require intelligence uh, in a faster or slower way, and the, you know, in a sense, the time factor involved, which makes a difference. Yeah, well, I think consciousness is very relevant, uh, at least in the following sense, and that is that many of us tend to be conscious of the world as we see it. And the way people of our group or tribe see it. And the result has been, especially in the history of the United States, uh, a long period in which, for example, white people had a sort of shared consciousness of the world from their point of view, and they enslaved black people. Or men had a certain consciousness of the world from their point of view, uh, and they dominated over women and women weren't allowed to vote. I think the single biggest challenge we face today is one of consciousness. And it's it's actually related to a term used, but in a different sense. You were talking about localization. We're too localized in our consciousness. We don't think enough about how others are conscious of the world. So when we have wars, for example, often you'll hear the... Um, perpetrator uh, talking about his or her usually his view uh expansive view of the role of his country um in the world and it's a consciousness of one it's usually an invented history uh that has very little to do with thinking about how do people in the other place see it it's not just russia and ukraine where you know putin has dreams of a supposed empire uh, we saw it in the United States with Vietnam and with many other uh, ill-fated invasions. Uh, we saw it in the era of imperialism in Europe, where the consciousness it was people like me, and not trying to think about how people like them perceived the world. So I think what's most missing from consciousness is to go beyond the tribalism that is coming back in the United States with the, I would say, pathetic polarization of the country, which is purposely worsened by politicians uh, groveling for votes, and to try to understand how other people see the world and then seek a common good so that everyone can help to be helped to be happy and jointly to make the world a better place instead of better just for people like us. This is fantastic because um, 
it kind of takes us beyond necessarily uh, any of the intelligence categories or factors to some sense of a feeling which we will get into the feeling the feeling of self what is myself so we identify and i'm repeating in a different way some of what i feel are your your interests and concerns in that field and that is the sense of self i'm just giving it a definition if the sense of self is just myself which is in this body then that's one thing but as you said you know the self also extends to the family uh, the intimate people extends to one's society and sometimes can extend to one's race to one's belonging to one's country and that is also part of um, of instincts in a sense the instinct of uh, who am i and i have to protect myself and defend myself against any other because the other can be a threat to me and therefore the sense of self is part of consciousness consciousness uh, there is consciousness of the environment uh, of course of the objects that we see on the outside but there is an underlying aspect of consciousness which is to be the conscious of the self who am i i am this i am that and uh, we feel that the expansion of the self uh, the expansion of consciousness uh, which joins your fourth element of wisdom uh, is an important aspect of understanding uh, how we can manage our life and the life of our future our children and also the children of the world and our existence on planet earth so if we expand the self to include others uh, we expand the self to include even nature the environment our world i guess this is goes in the direction of uh, what you have described as wisdom and wisdom means i'm not limited in this particular body and i if i see the world flourishing the world in peace then my inner sense of happiness grows and so this aspect it depends on intelligence also to be intelligent enough to do it but also the expansion of the self on the level of consciousness so the development of consciousness and the understanding of some basic level of life that is beyond the, the localization in the brain the localization uh, in the identification of one's identity to belong to a certain group you know i am a new yorker i love new york and i am this and i love that and the rest i don't care uh, and now we realize that no we are one one human reality we are also connected to um, the environment and what happens in the environment and it's beautiful to see this addition of wisdom and intelligence. What I would emphasize is the self, including others not like yourself. So when we talk about others, it's not just others in general, but others who are, you perceive as different from you. Because what's happening in the world today is that leaders are sometimes called pseudo transformational leaders they pretend to be populist but they all have the same pitch uh, and that is that you're a victim uh these others who are these targeted others are preventing you from achieving what you deserve uh you have to get back what is rightfully yours I'm the one who's going to do it for you if you just follow me and be strictly obedient and don't make any waves you will have a happy contented life and all you have to do is give up yourself and yeah. become part of my cult they don't call them cults but we have a lot of leaders including in the United States who are, who are basically cult leaders they're no different from the Jim Joneses of the world except uh their names uh and hopefully they won't uh, you won't end up with a mass suicide or murder but they're cult leaders and 
it, people think they're finding themselves when they're really joining cults and they stop thinking for themselves. So instead of gaining themselves, they lose themselves in this kind of mob. In the pseudo populists, the would be dictators and the dictators, they all have the same playbook and people fall for it because everyone feels their life is not as good as it could be. Instead of asking, what could I do to make it better? The pseudo populists, the would be dictators and the dictators say, it isn't your fault. It's these guys fault. Uh, you know, and at different times in history, it's different targeted groups. But the ploy is always the same. Yeah, this is wonderful. Um, I had a podcast recently with Dr. Uh, Jan uh, McGilchrist, who is very much into left brain, right brain. And he feels that humanity, if it stays on what he defines as left, left brain kind of focused, which includes categorizing, separating, uh, sense of self-righteousness, sense of if you, do, you don't feel and think like I do, uh, you are wrong and like that, we are committing uh, mass suicide as, as a humanity. And so that really rejoices the same concept of uh, diversity uh, as accepting diversity as part of the beauty of creation and accepting the other, as you say, uh, as part of myself without them being like myself, be it physically, be it mentally, be it politically, be it belonging to whatever, everyone can still belong to something, believe in something. And that can be uh, the richness of diversity that allows us to uh, grow and discover new things and uh, include uh, the others rather than eliminate the others. In fact, all the tyrants and all, you know, the great uh, supposed unifiers of the world that went out, as you said, and I'm again repeating in other words what you said, that went and say, now if I make everybody speak the same language, behave in the same way, believe in the same things, then I'm going to create unity because there will be no clash of differences on the surface. And that is really the big mistake I feel uh, that many have had, that is to create unity, you don't have to eliminate diversity. To the contrary, let all the diversity grow in its value, but realize that underlying diversity, there is a unity. And that unity grows with the growth of consciousness, with the growth of awareness and of the growth of the self. And again, I'm repeating because such a beautiful point you brought, growth of the self doesn't mean that you should be like me and that is myself. It is when actually myself grows to encompass others in a sense that I feel we are one together. And what is very interesting that even in physics today, we have a realization that underlying all diversity is fields, fields of you know, quantum fields, of electromagnetism, weak forces, strong forces, gravitational forces that are actually being more and more unified into what many are calling the unified field of all the laws of nature, which tells us that ultimately there is one field that appears as many. And in this, transcending meditation and transcendental meditation it's precisely that in fact people can think oh it's a meditation is it a cult is it a belief system etc it is really not it is just going back inwards and finding through direct experience that the self is unbounded that it is not limited that is why why it's called transcendental which means to go beyond the surface and go to the source and then from the source which is our true inner ultimate self realize that all the differences emerge like a tree with flowers and branches and flower and fruits etc getting the same sap and appearing as different but the sap is ultimately the same so it's where our consciousness falls and our intelligence in that sense understands the reality of the unity at the basis of diversity. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with everything you said. I wouldn't relate it to left brain, right brain. Right. But the idea is, I agree with all those. What pseudo populists do, these leaders, is rather than appealing to people's better natures, they appeal to fear, fear of people different from yourself, anger, uh, the sense that I've been gypped in life, uh, a sense of victimhood, uh, uh, sort of the generalized anxiety we all have in us, uh, and and to a sense that you you can be the master not only of yourself but of others too. So the ploys are always the same, and instead of appealing to let's let's what I call transcendentally love each other and care for each other, uh, let's look out. For number one, uh, look out for yourself. There's even there was a bestseller looking out for number one, and that mentality kind of captures the problem with so much of what's going on in the world today. It's wonderful. So all is this happening on an analytic kind of, but also a creative and practical levels. And how does this uh, translate into feeling? Uh, the ultimate feeling we have, because at the end of the day, we analyze things, we want to succeed, but the end product of all of that is how we feel about it, how we're feeling we're doing. Uh, you know, one can be satisfied intellectually with, with something, but might be on the feeling level, not so happy or sad or um, depressed or anxious uh, and all of that. And uh, it, it also takes us to love and which is a great feeling of connectedness and relationship uh, to wisdom, which you are now uh, really highlighting, but wisdom uh, in terms of others, that means we can translate it into love also, in a sense, love of the others. So you have a very profound understanding and theory about love. And whether the love that you describe between people on a personal level can be extended or these dynamics of love, which you beautifully described in terms of passion, intimacy and commitment, then can be translated in terms of that uh, component of wisdom, where the love is not just for one person, but now can we translate that into for society also as a whole. Yeah, the basic idea of the theory of love is that love, whether it's for a lover or a child or for something larger, has three components, intimacy, which is feelings that we have been talking about of connectedness, of communication, of caring, of friendship, of wanting the best for someone else passion which is the excitement and the the sort of sparky feel toward one or more other people and commitment which is that you're in it for keeps uh, and i think that that can apply at, at many different levels different kinds of love come out of different combinations of those so intimacy by itself is friendship but intimacy plus passion is romantic love or passion plus uh, commitment I refer to as foolish love uh, <laughs> because you have no intimacy or just commitment by itself I refer to as empty love because you're committed but you don't have the feelings there. Uh, and what motivates different what I call triangles of love or stories uh, so one story could be, for example, a fairy tale story where you imagine a prince and a princess together. Or another could be a travel story where you're, say, two people traveling together through life. Or a business story, which is we're business partners in this deal. Uh, another story, there are bad stories like a horror story with a terrorizer and a victim. But the idea is that I think that the pseudo transformational leaders always appeal to different kinds of horror stories. Uh, and that is where uh, you're being victimized and it's time for you now 
to be the vanquisher, the conqueror, and to put those other people in their place. All of these leaders have the same deal. You know, whether it used to be the whites on the blacks and now it's the Russians on Ukraine or men on women, it's always uh, you're better than they are and uh, now you should get your just desserts. And if you're starting to feel like that, uh, you're you're not increasing your individuality. It's being taken away uh, for you to join a, a sort of cultish mob. That's beautiful. How how can we look at these aspects of love when we look at wisdom towards society? For example, um, is it only intelligence, wisdom related to the intelligence of thinking and feeling that I have to do something good for the world, I have to improve my life, my environment, I have to connect with others. But do these three components of love which are very clearly defined and very pertinent in a personal relationship, but as you said, could be with child, with a friend, to society as a whole, which means should one feel intimacy with society in the sense of um, knowing what is there, knowing what's going on and feeling personally involved? Should one feel commitment, like I commit myself to make the world better should I do it with passion and excitement? And would these three factors, when they are balanced, are the necessary ones? Did you take that into this uh, yeah, wisdom I, uh, category? Yeah, yeah, that's actually something I'm working on now. The theory applies to your relations with the world uh, in the sense that intimacy is about that other people are not really that different from you. That if you're willing to let go of artificial barriers, you can communicate with and care about people who aren't like yourself. Passion is a passion for making the world better and for helping others beside yourself. And commitment is that you're committed to do something. You're not just talking about it, but you're committed uh, to caring for others and for the world. The problem is that in today's world, I also have a theory of hate. And in the theory of hate, the the bad leaders, what they do is they, they use these components in a sort of perverse way. So they encourage negation of intimacy, which is those other people aren't like me, they're despicable, uh, they use terms like cockroach or garbage or animals or apes. The language is always the same. And we have candidates in our country who have started using this language. It's that these other people, you, you'd you never want your daughter or your son to marry one of them. You'd, you can't communicate with them because they're not even human. It's the same thing the Nazis did, really. Uh, and passion is directed in a negative way. Uh, you know, let's get them. I, you know, unless we go after them, they're going to get us. That's sort of what Putin's doing right now uh, with Ukraine, uh, making up these sort of phony uh, stories about it's either us or them. It's the it's the East or the West. Um, so they invent these kinds of stories and then they try to gain commitment of the people to these artificial stories. And the way they make people fall for it is either... You know, either you're with us or you're against us. And in Russia right now, you go to jail for 15 years if uh, you say anything that isn't quite what the government wants you to say. So they use a combination of join us and things will be good. Don't join us and uh, things will go really badly for you. And they encourage hate. Uh, and that's what bad leaders do. And it's happening in the United States. It's not just uh, in other countries. It's happening right here. Uh, the encouragement of divisions among people for political gain. Yeah, it's really interesting to see how if you take the opposite, you understand more the positive side also. Like yes. you said, you know, when you go into hate, you understand more actually the importance of love when it's guided in the right direction. So it's the other side of the coin uh, sometimes reveals a lot about uh, what is the, the principal yes. factor. So what to do about all this? How to improve intelligence? How to improve relations? How to create wisdom? 
I guess one is education, uh, communication, awareness, but um, what one is, of course, what you're doing is laying it out. And then that means awakening uh, one's awareness, one's intelligence, one's feelings to this realities. And already when this is awakened, one starts asking questions. So <clears throat> what to do about it? Is it on the level of trying to be more intelligent, telling people, look, you can be intelligent in these different ways. Now let's be intelligent by being wise and save our world or something we can do about the feeling uh, level or all of that. Yeah, I was just writing about that this morning. Uh, what you do is in schools, instead of teaching content that's divorced from world problems, you teach content where students think about world problems in these terms and they simulate how they would solve them. Uh, the main thing that's missing is really critical thinking. It's not just accepting what you're told because some authority told it to you and then accepting it on faith. Uh, we rely too much on bad authorities and faith in bad authorities. And it's really thinking for yourself and realizing that if you're being told things that don't correspond to what's going on in the world that you can see with your eyes. If you have a leader who's constantly lying to you and you don't care, then you're not thinking critically. If you have a leader who, who doesn't make sense, their story changes from one day to another, and they, do, they actually do that on purpose so that you will accept them as an authority. You don't care about the world anymore. You simply view the eyes through this pseudo populist leader, if you're in that boat, you're in the wrong place. So we need to educate students to think for themselves, to make sure that what they believe corresponds to what's out in the world, and that it makes sense, that it's internally consistent. Um, and that's exactly what pseudo populist leaders don't want. Uh, education, education, very important. Yeah. Because, um, as we know, people get prejudice. Uh, they, you know, start wearing glasses of different colors and belonging to different basic aspects and principles and beliefs, even that uh, you know that connect them to some realities of which, in some cases, scares them if they do the wrong thing they're going to go to this part of, of, of eternity. And if they do the other thing, they go to other part of eternity and you have to follow exactly that. And it's amazing that when one has grown with these um, prejudice and uh, narrow feelings of uh, vision and belonging, that one actually starts wearing inner glasses that have colors uh, that are colored by those principles and then you can say well look this is uh, white paper and they'll tell you no it's yellow and here you there is no logic or intelligence or feeling or anything that can make them see white because they have yellow you can tell them a million times you're you're you know you're not seeing the thing in the right view but this is their filter which has come from their education. And so the task is, uh, it's quite uh, demanding to change all of that, obviously. I mean, all the wise people have been like yourself, uh, trying to, to do this and educate and say, we should continue to do that. But uh, in, in my perspective, uh, my humble perspective, uh, we have to also clean up the system from its prejudices and stresses. And this is how I personally uh, looked at transcendental meditation as a technology of removing what we call stress. And therefore the stress is all the prejudice, all the deposit of uh, experiences and beliefs that are leading us often in the, in the wrong perception where not intelligence, nor feelings, nor even uh, conditioning, punishing and rewarding seem to, to remove. And so 
this going back to the real inner transcendental self removes these blocks of prejudice and stress and fears from the other. Because if you've had an experience with somebody in your environment repeatedly, uh, and you built an idea about their whole group as being a bad group or a negative group, there is more than just explaining that, no, come on, this is right, you should be this, you should be that. You have to actually clean up the system uh, from those impressions that are probably sitting there somewhere as molecules and uh, circuits of the brain and, and, and physiology also at the same time that that color your vision of things. Mm -hmm. Yes, I totally agree with that. It's beautiful. Dr. Sternberg, we've taken amazing time from yourself. It's so rich. I'd like to go for hours with you and maybe see you again and discuss other points that you'd like to say. But is there something specific or something you'd like our viewers and listeners to, to understand and hear that we didn't cover? I think we've pretty well covered it. I think the main message is that uh, everyone can do something to make the world better. And in doing that, they'll not only make the world better, but they'll feel better about themselves. Beautiful, beautiful. Wide range from intelligence to feeling to the self expanding and making life better for everyone on every level. Such a beautiful vision and study, a lifelong uh, journey of understanding human reality. We are delighted to have you, uh, Dr. Sternberg, and we wish you a continuation of your wonderful work to make uh, humanity and the whole globe, our, our planet, a better place for everyone. Thank you so much. My joy.